space. Uh, UK, I think it's raining. Uh, Calgary, it's snowing. So after this pool, I have to go out and shower the, the road. So I haven't done it uh, on September. I'm learning how to be Canadian. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. I have uh, uh, Richard Tav with us. We are going to uh, squeeze him, and, and I have lots of questions to him. Uh, our webinar Wednesday is about how to move from technical uh, skills to IT consulting stuff. And uh, I'd like to just, you know, uh, I think everybody knows uh, 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 Richard Tabworth. He's running the uh, Tab blog, which is the most popular MSP li really, uh, based blog in the world. And uh, he's a really great guy because he is not talking about theories. He's, he's, he had the experience as an MSP. He sold his business and he became a consultant for MSPs. So that I think for for him, he can have this kind of uh, great experience how to become from a kind of IT solution provider to a generic uh, consultant. And he see of their clients how the transition people are doing, why they do the transition. So I would like to just let you uh, have a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and see if I uh, said something wrong. So uh, welcome, nothing. welcome Richard Hub. Thank you, Dennis. And the first thing I should say, it's uh, I'm here in Birmingham in the UK and it's beautiful sunshine, no rain. We have two days of sunshine a year in the UK and this is one of them, so it's uh, going well. But uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak with you today. So very, very briefly, my background is I am an IT geek by nature. I'm a technician. Um, I've always loved technology. And uh, my background was that I worked in the corporate IT industry. So I worked for companies like Ernst & Young, um, the NHS, uh, GE Capital, um, doing technical work. Um, and I started my own IT business as a one-man band back in 2003. And I was like, probably like a number of people who were joining us on the call today, um, I was a one-man band fixing computers, crawling under desks, and doing technical work for a number of years. Um, and then in 2005, 2006, I think I'm going to say it was, um, I decided that I no longer wanted to own a job. I wanted to own a business. And so I started focusing on um, doing more of the business owner activities, being less of a technician and doing more uh, business activities, doing the sales, doing the marketing, really growing the business. So the business grew well. I sold the business at the end of 2011. Uh, and I should say, during the time I was running the business, I um, uh, was always blogging and speaking to community groups and really being open and honest and sharing what it was like to, to run my IT business. And so what happened, uh, Dennis, when I sold my IT business uh, was that a number of other people who ran IT businesses phoned me up and said, well, now that you're no longer a competitor to us, would you uh, come to us and would you share some of the uh, things that you've learned? So that was just over three years ago now, and I now work with the owners of IT businesses, uh, predominantly in the UK, but also in America and Australia as well, uh, and throughout Europe. And I really help them to move from being a technician to being a business owner, um, to focus on what's important, um, to do the things that are important, and essentially to make more money. So. Ah, that's not bad, <clears throat> actually. So I have, I have a first question is that uh, actually that's, uh, so, so many uh, notion about these MSP programs and is it you know declining or you know it's, it's still growing? Uh, what's your opinion? Why does MSP need to move from technical to to the consulting stuff? So why we need to do that? I, I think that's a really good question, and I, I think the first thing that I would say is that um, times are changing, and technology is actually getting a lot easier um, uh, to deal with. People, I mean, back even as little as sort of um, sort of five, six years ago, when I was running an MSP, um, people would still pay very well for somebody to connect Ethernet cables, uh, to crawl under desks, to set up smartphones and telephones and things. And there are people who will still pay for that now, but not very many. Think about it. When you get an iPad or an iPhone, uh, you get it out of the box, and it's really easy to set up, isn't it? Um, you know, for any, any, any technicians who are on the call at the moment, 
Um, I'm going to guess that your life is probably similar to mine in that the number of technical support queries that you've got from friends and from relatives has gone down over the past couple of years. My mom doesn't phone me not nearly as much as she used to for help because the IT just works. So I think the you know it's a it's an overwhelming move towards simplification of technology, and that's a good thing. Um, the downside to that, of course, is whereas many of us used to uh, make a comfortable living um, plugging cables in and, and, and doing things that we knew how to do, those times are, are pretty much going. They're not going to disappear. There's still a need for people to do that type of work, but the number of people who are willing to pay for it is disappearing. And so I think more and more we're going to need to, as IT business owners and IT consultants, focus less on the technical and focus more on the business side, um, on being a consultant, helping people understand how they can make the most out of technology, not just set it up for them. All right. And actually, uh, we have different uh, you know, notions about consulting, IT consultancy, like uh, virtual CIO, CIO type of role. Can you give us some you know, uh, definition of you? What, what is the... What is the is it the same like an IT consultant and the virtual CIO, or how you see that uh, in, in, in this term? Uh, personally, and I'm going to be really upfront and honest about this, Dennis, I'm not bothered about the, um, the label that people give themselves. Okay. Um, when I, uh, back when I was running an MSP, um, uh, before I was running an MSP, I should say, people used to call themselves value-added resellers. Then, uh, sorry, they were resellers, then value-added resellers then IT consultants, then MSPs, then cloud uh, aggregators, and so on and so forth. So I don't think it really matters what you call yourself. I think business consultant uh, is, or IT consultant is as good a term as any. Um, I like the idea of virtual CIO as well, um, but for a lot of clients, that's going to go straight over their head maybe. They're not going to think, I need a CIO. What I think they do realize they need is somebody trusted um, to give them advice on how to connect technology, how to make technology work for their business. So I'm very keen not to get too hung up on what we call ourselves, uh, but to really work on providing the value um, uh, where people want to keep working with us and want to keep coming back to us. Okay, I'm going to fire up a poll now uh, about how deep are you into this kind of, uh, we call it virtual CIO, but what uh, Richard defined. So just uh, give me back the, your your uh, uh, insights about that. And I have the next question here. Then that. Uh, uh, and so, how do you think that? Uh, why is it beneficial to have this type of uh, IT consultancy, virtual CIO, trusted advisory role as a managed service provider? Because you know what, it's lots of people hearing us have a fairly big company like uh, in this case 20, 30 uh, uh, technicians. They are doing lots of other consulting uh, jobs as well. But, but how, you can, how you can use this uh, kind of solution with your traditionally technology infrastructure management uh, type of services? How you see that? What's the synergy between those? Sure. Well, I think um, for, uh, and I'm going to speak for, for people um, who are joining us on the call today as well, that um, if they're anything like me, they're primarily, or, or were, um, see themselves as technicians, and now they really want to see themselves as business owners um, and business consultants. The challenge is, of course, that if our clients only see us as the IT guy, as the PC person, the person who just fixes things, similar to a plumber or an electrician, um, mm -hmm. You know, it's the difference, I think, between um, uh, knowing that you go and speak to a builder to do work, to, to put bricks on top of one another, um, but you wouldn't speak to a builder um, perhaps to design a house for you or to get ideas on what the construction of a house would look like. You would speak to an architect. Uh, and I think that's probably, that may be a poor analogy, but that gives some idea. We uh, think that, I think that we no longer want to be seen as the PC guy, as the IT guy. We want to be seen as somebody who gives business advice, who can help business owners to, to do what they're all in business to do, to make more money. So the technology aspects of things is not nearly as, as important to the business owners as making more money. 
Now, some business owners will tell you they want to free up their time, but making more money is one way uh, to enable them to free up more time. So ultimately, I think it comes down to enabling them to make more money. I think we can we can get up some speed because based on the results, uh, here are more likely the uh, people who have basic VCRO services or moderate level. So we don't have anybody who who just starting it, and we don't have anybody who doesn't have. So just I think keep couple of you know basics and just get right on the top. That uh, uh, what my question is that uh, you know what it's like. Uh, in my understanding, the biggest. Uh, question here is that doing consultancy is, is really great to what you are seeing and uh, go into and, and give, create this kind of high level perspective to the clients is, is awesome. I think by nature most of the MSPs are, are consultants because you know you are consulting with your, with, your, with your buddies about your phones and anything because you are kind of geek or something like that. So basically that is by nature that, that How to get to the notion which you are saying, hey, I'm a client, why I need a CIO? So it's like not nobody is shopping around having a virtual CIO because they have a problem, so the client does have the problem, but they don't see the solution. And, and, the, and the MSP see that it's solution for a problem, but somehow it's a problem how to uh, put those two uh, things together. So how you see that in a, like, Packaging, pricing, delivery side of that. What's the challenges and what what's your best uh, advice here? Well, I, th I think it comes down to again what the business owner sees value in, and I think you're absolutely right. It is a challenge to sell yourself as a virtual CIO or a trusted advisor, um, but I think the analogy I'd make is with accountants. Uh, so accountants typically you engage with an accountant. Um, to save you money on taxes, to do your taxes and to do some of that type of work for you. But for most business owners, if you ask them who they trust for advice, they would say probably their accountant, maybe their solicitor second, that type of thing. So the accountant is hired for one reason, to do the taxes which needs to be done, but very quickly becomes a source, uh, a trusted advisor, somebody that the uh, business owner goes to and asks not only questions about finance, but all sorts of things. And so my gut feeling is that as IT business owners, where we want to be pitching our services is much more along the lines of accountants who, yeah, it's a given that we're going to look after your IT for you. But we're not just going to fix stuff. We're not just going to set stuff up for you. We're going to take the time to actually share with you how you can use technology to give you a competitive advantage in your business, how you can use technology um, to free up your time, how you can use technology to make more money. Now, initially, when you speak to a business owner, those might not be the questions that are front of mind. They might be thinking, well, we've got slow PCs or we've got an old server. We want you to come in and fix those. And that's, again, that's a given. You're going to do that type of work for them. But really, there's opportunities in every interaction that you have with a client to let them know that you're thinking about their business and about their pain and about uh, freeing up their time and helping them to make more money. So I think every, every single time we speak to a business owner, we've got to act like a trusted advisor, we've got to act like a consultant, and act less like an IT geek and more like a business consultant. And I think over time, people start to realize that uh, and when you're providing that type of value, you can command a premium uh, for your work, and actually clients will seek you out and refer you to other people as well. When you become that invaluable advisor, um, you're much more likely to retain clients, and you're much more likely to charge a premium for your time and effort. Hmm. Uh, I just fired up the next one that what you are interested on that, so please just uh, have, a, have a look on that. And I have the next uh, <clears throat> uh, topic is what I was uh, bothering me that I was uh, checking and I made a blog about this week uh, about I, I have the kind of uh, spice works analysis about the IT budget and spending on IT budget. And I was checking what they thinking on, on what is inside the IT budget. And that was all this infrastructure kind of thing. So that was my understanding that they were defining this uh, whole IT is what we don't think is, is, is the same. So they are thinking PCs, servers, devices, 
365, these type of infrastructure things. And what I see is the biggest flaw about talking MSPs with their clients is basically they are in this flaw. So when I go to the client and I say, you know what, have a competitive edge with IT. And he's thinking, you know what, having better devices, having better office, having, you know, I don't care. I don't believe that. Yep. IT is not giving me anything. And I think that's when think you that's have to step ahead and say, oh, what do you think about IT? And he tells you about devices and softwares and things like that. Do you have any problem with that? No, not really. It's working. Okay. I tell you a story. And then we usually tell about a story which is compelling, uh, you know, a uh, story about how a company was able to redefine their style. It could be a coffee shop using iPads to have orders, swipe the cards, and get really great experience. Or it can be a go-kart racer who track your time when you are doing the go-kart and creating like a Formula One experience. All of them is the same, just you know the technology makes difference. And when you get this kind of vision to the people that, hey, you know what, that's something which we are talking about, IT. So then when you can start the journey, and that's what I call reframing, reframing the term IT. And then you can go and, and, and open up a new bunch of possibilities of applications, CRM, ERP, inventory management, everything which is basically they need and they don't have the capacity to figure out, you know, evaluate. And manage the processes, educate the people, things like that. The biggest flaw in IT, the, and, and I say MSP, what the traditional work here is that when, when, when the CEO is spending a lot of money to upgrade like an office, what's happening? You go there like an MSP, you do your work, and everybody is complaining. You know, everybody is complaining that this is a button, it's a different. I don't, I find, you know, everybody is confused and everybody is pissed off because they are not able to do their work. And the CEO is pissed off, hey, I invested a lot of money here. And you are pissed off and you are the MSP say, hey, we done our job. Nobody went there, created an education, created like asking what's your process is, how can I help you, and creating some kind of value at this service. Because we are thinking, that's done. We that's installed done. the office install and that's great. That's great. So I think that the expectation about the service provider and the expectation about the IT as a word, what, what do we think about this term? So uh, it wasn't a question, sorry, but it was coming out of me because I was so pissed off to see that, hey, Jesus, that's the problem. The problem is that if you are talking to your client, they see you in their glass that you are an IT guy. So they don't expect any business stuff from you. So, Richard, tell us how to change that with the client and how to step up really as a consultant, how to get, you know, the background and how to step up that I'm going to be credible here. I'm not just credible to set up your iPhone. I'm credible to give you real business advice. I think that's what matters here. Yeah, and I think the answer is actually a lot more simple than we give it credit for, and that's to talk to them as one business owner to another and to say, hey, what's happening in your business? So, um, you know, if you're speaking to a business owner and you're talking about technology all the time, they're going to see you just as a technology person. But if you're saying to them, hey, okay, what's happening? Forget about technology for a minute. What's happening in your business? They might say things like, well, we're having problems with uh, productivity of staff. Um, now, immediately, most of us think there's a technology solution to that. We can put in place web content filtering or something. But if we immediately revert to type and start talking about the technology, they're not really going to understand it. Um, what we need to do is to talk to them in their language. So if they've got, if they share with you as a business owner that they've got a problem with productivity, don't make assumptions over what that is. Say to them. Okay, what what have you tried so far? Um, and they'll share something with you, and you'll you'll understand a little bit more about the problem. Okay, if you could wave a magic wand and get rid of it, what what would that look like? And they'll start to share more with you. So I think a lot of it is to do with speaking to them in the language that they understand, and also um, 
not making assumptions, uh, not talking as much, which is really difficult for somebody yeah. like me, Dennis. I love to talk, but listening more to what they say and responding appropriately using the language that they use as well. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It's, I think it completely makes sense. So, so make it uh, like a practical. What we are using for this type of conversation, which called business model generation, you can go to www.businessmodelgeneration.com, and you can see the same canvas which we have in in Southern Sea. Actually, we have two types, and this is asking a question about value proposition. How you get your clients? What's your client segment? How you treat their clients? What's the you know partnership? What's the resources? How you get money? Things like that. And this is like a really, really, really great tool for a for a really less skilled consultant, like a starting MSP, to have something you know like a framework. You can ask these type of questions. You can have like in a in your within A4 format, and you just can. You know, ask the questions which is inside this kind of uh, you know canvas, and these type of business questions you was like firing up because you have some experience on that. But you can analyze the client in like 20, 30 minutes and just ask questions and take notes and yeah, and what do you mean by that? All right, and how you see that? And blah, blah, blah. and 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 you naturally in a position when 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 you are being trusted because you are asking questions one. Second, you are following something because that's something you know. You see, they see that you are following something, and uh, and then you can create some kind of. What I I, I learned something with our CEO in Hungary. He said me that uh, he told me that if you are a consultant, and if you say three things in a meeting and three things is relevant, and you have hundred percent hit rate, you are you blown away. If you say 10 things and 40 is great, you have 40 percent, and that's that's not enough. So say less, ask more, and just say when you see you are hitting something. So that's uh, yeah. I think that's the how how we form it or how we try to form it as in our MSP. Is it any is it make any sense to you? It does, it does, and I think there's there's something else here. I'm I'm probably get on my soapbox a little bit and talk about what we do in the IT industry. And um, we constantly believe that we're there to provide answers um, uh, to people when actually part of the role of a consultant is not to say, hey, shut up now, I've, I've, I've heard enough from you, I'm going to give you the answer. Because people very rarely like being told what to do. Uh, so I think part of it is to, um, to keep quiet more often, to ask pertinent questions, and let the other person uh, explain. Let the client explain to you the way they're feeling, yeah. the impact that it has on them, and if they don't share those sort of things with you, ask them, how does that make you feel? What impact does that have on you personally? Not as a business, as a business owner, how does that make you feel, that problem that you've described to me? And then instead resist the urge to jump in and provide the solution. Dig a bit deeper. By the end of the conversation, you may have only asked three or four questions, but they're going to have unloaded with you on uh, what the problem is, how much money it costs them, uh, how it makes them feel, just what they've tried to do to fix it so far, and the lengths they would go to make that problem go away. They're unloading on you, and they're confiding in you and saying, hey, these are all the things that are wrong. Then, and only then, you can say, okay, how can I help you? <laughs> yeah, and exactly. That's, that's a big, it's a big change from saying, "Ah, I know how I can help you." Uh, a lot of us in the IT industry, I think, um, uh, maybe I'm saying this unfairly. Maybe everybody's not. Definitely, everybody's not like this. But I come across a lot of people, and I was definitely one of them, that uh, assumes I've got all the answers and wants to to tell people, "Hey, you should do things this way." Yeah. Um, as a consultant, the work I do with IT business owners now is asking them what the impact is on them, uh, how they see me helping them, what would they like the result to be, and then you can sort of help them in that direction. You earn a lot more trust, you earn a lot more credibility yeah. from that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, this is this is the, uh, the, how to say, the notion about challenger sale, which we were talking about uh, people could be last time, and uh, we have this whole concept of what we call 
uh, discovery process, not sales process, because it's about discovering something, being curious. And then the natural uh, consequence is the sales, but that's just a, re a result of the process. It's not the process itself. So it's like a really interesting to be there. And what I would like to uh, challenge and, and go that I think we, we can figure it out that, okay, so you have to go to the client, ask the questions, have some tiny framework around that, create, starting the conversation, and then when they say, you know what, I want, I want badly somebody like you to have me. Send, send me a proposal. And then, then what you are sending? What's the packaging of this stuff? Because you know what? The problem is that if it's like time and material, like in the good old days, we do time and material in IT, and then we evolve to MFP, like a fixed fee. If you go with this type of stuff with high level of hourly rate, uh, it gives the same, you know, gut feeling with the clients that, oh, I'm paying a lot for, for just, you know, hang around. What is, how do you feel that? So how we can sell those type of stuff if they see the value? How we can frame it? How we can create some kind of value in a practical way? So how to make it more practical, this stuff? How do you see that? Well, I, I think um, th there's actually a crossover here. So uh, to to some of my uh, history, um, when I uh, or, or I am still blogging, but when I was initially writing the blog as an IT business owner, I did that for my own benefit. I just put it put it out there, you know, what was going on in my world and that. Um, but clients came to know us because we got the blog. It established me as an expert in the uh, the space. And actually, when I sold my MSP business. Um, although I hadn't planned that, other IT business owners started approaching me. But I did put myself out there, and clients knew that. And you know, um, and I wasn't preaching. I wasn't saying this is the way you should do things. I'm just sharing uh, the challenges that I'd had. So I think part of it is if you want to make the move away from just being a technician to being uh, uh, to be more of a business consultant, you do need to start sharing some thought leadership some ideas on how things can change. You do need to put yourself out there. Now, for me, it was a blog, um, occasionally standing up in front of user groups. Um, for, for the IT business owners who are, uh, are on the uh, call here today, it might be blogging, it might be podcasting, but it equally might be things that they're already familiar with, such as going along to a local business networking event and standing up and talking to people in a 10-minute spot about how they can make more money from technology. Instead of talking about what's the best smartphone, why not stand up and say, hey, we're working with clients who work with us um, because they value um, our guidance to help them make more money from technology. And, and again, you've got to put yourself out there a little bit. Once you start establishing yourself uh, as, as a business consultant and start putting yourself out there as a business consultant, you actually attract people who value that. So I mean, you, you will, you'll find it a lot easier because people who want a business consultant will approach you. And people who um, uh, want uh, business advice on how to make more money will approach you. You're no longer seen as the IT guy. So I think there's two ways to do it. You've got to, with your existing clients, you've got to reframe yourself. So if only yeah. somebody had come up with a name for a business like that, it'd be making lots of money. Um, they've got to reframe uh, the sales with their existing clients by the language they use. But for new clients, the type of new clients they attract, they need to project the image of being a business consultant, not just a technology guy. And you'll find the type of clients that you have approaching you are a lot of fun to work with. They value and yeah. respect your time. And ultimately, they'll pay more money for your time. Exactly, and what I see here, Richard, uh, one thing, I, I'm firing up another poll, uh, just what's the biggest challenge on, on these stuff and, and see what people are saying. Uh, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, what I see, uh, traditionally IT, for the smaller shops, uh, having an issue with their existing client base. Uh, they most likely serving these type of 5, 10, 15 type of clients, and you know that they don't have the revenue to create the budget which can serve decent amount of uh, uh, 
uh, money which you can put your hours behind that and create some value. So it's fair to say that like uh, below 25, 30 people client, it's really, really, if you have, you have some place to, to go like a consultant or, or like a virtual CIO, but that's where the, the whole thing is starting. And because everybody's having a problem to, to, to convert these clients to, to this type of consulting business, they have a kind of, you know, disappointment that uh, ah, they don't need that, it's not a viable business, we don't make money. Because I think they are attracting the wrong clients, and the question is that how they can get the good clients, which basically the people with the, uh, with the, uh, with a 30, 40, 50 people company. And uh, yeah. how you see that, so how the, how the IT company trying to learn more consulting can go immediately to like a 60, 70, or even 100, 200 people company to, to give advice. What, what, what do you see, how, how, how they can be there to do that? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, the first thing I would say, just to address the point about um, you know reframing your relationship with clients uh, on an existing basis, to be really upfront and honest, I've gone through this process, that there are going to be some clients who just don't get it. They see you as the IT guy, but more importantly, they see IT as a cost. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a necessary evil. Now, um, you may not be in a position to say goodbye to those clients, but what will happen is if you put yourself out there and start acting and behaving as a business consultant would in the wider world, you will start to attract some of those bigger clients who want to talk to you about the services that you offer. At that stage, you can start to move away from some of those clients who just see you as an IT guy. Those clients, and they're typically, Dennis, you know this as well as I do, those clients who only view you as the IT guy are also the clients who typically nickel and dime you on all the in they pay their invoices late, they want hardware cheaper, they say, oh, I can get it cheaper off Google products and than I can. And they're a they're a pain to deal with. You know, at, at best they're not a lot of fun to deal with, but sometimes they'll give you sleepless nights and just make you uh, annoyed working with them. Now I'm not suggesting for a moment that um, everybody on the call go and sack all of those clients. But what happens if you start moving in slightly different circles, if you start putting yourself out there as a business consultant dealing with businesses who want to make more money and who see technology as a competitive advantage, you'll start to attract those type of clients. You'll start to have conversations with them. And then you can start to let some of those uh, other clients, those frustrating clients, go. So it's not an overnight process, but you've got to present yourself as a business consultant to existing clients. You can, uh, not everybody will get it, but over time you'll start to replace those clients with the ones that you really want to work with. Exactly, and, and what, I, what, I, what I see here is uh, uh, if you are not experienced uh, consultant, you need uh, these kind of tools, which is, we call these workshops. Workshop meaning my understanding is that you go for an hour conversation with the client, and you have the agenda for that, and you have the you have the end and the beginning and everything. It it gives you some. It, 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 you can sell a product. Let's say we have let's say. Uh, like say the operational uh, effectivity measurement workshop, which is kind of not good for uh, like uh, marketing, but what what you can do or what we usually do in in, the, in our local MSP is create those type of workshops with nothing to do with IT, totally not. We are measuring where where is your bottleneck, and we have lots of you know you can download from the internet different type of questions we go through. Okay, how about sales? Do you have automation on sales? How are you marketing? How are the operation receivable? Blah, blah, blah. And you can see the pains here. Oh, down, 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 down. Business problems, and after that, you can attract the different business problem as a business problem, and have a business solution with some kind of technology. And you can be really precise on uh, vertical, like oil and gas industry, uh, let's say, 
a documentation problem solving workshop or something like that, or sales or growing problem. So you can see different companies around you want to uh, get uh, attracted by and, and create a kind of workshop around that one company. So, you know, we, Mr. Richard Tubb, we are doing workshops for IT consultants and we are looking for different solutions how to can get more revenue from the internet. Oh, are you interested? Of course you're interested. I go there, I ask these questions, and, and we have an hour, and I have an hour to get those type of uh, different solutions. And because it's a workshop, you can hand over something, so you can go back, because you have the results of the workshop, so you can go home, think, and go back with something. So it's, uh, I, I feel like to have a, like a practical point, because I try to be practical, uh, because that that people need to to get something and and and, and how we, how do you see those type of initiatives? Because we have to somehow have to differentiate ourselves that we are not an IT guy, and we have to reframe ourselves that we are not an IT guy. We can we can be an advisor because you know what you are you know lots of things around your CRM, your auto task, your connect lights, how is it working? You are well more advanced how to run a business based on technology and an ordinary CEO. So if you're not a kind of business consultant, still you know how to you know, create invoices here or there because you are solving your problem with these type of activities and uh, you have the knowledge. So I, I want to say that just go. So mo most people just, you know, think their self low. I'm not worth, I don't know, you know, I'm confused, what, they, what they're going to say. It's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you were talking about the um, the workshop format, which uh, I, I, I'm a great fan of. I know um, one of my clients that you've you've had on as a guest, Bruce Penson um, from ProDrive in the UK. He was saying that you know they've won some significant business based off the back of um, having a workshop rather than a sales meeting. Exactly. Um, uh, with with their clients and that, so that's really interesting. But I, I think to to the point. Um, on, on the workshops, what you're effectively doing is saying um, we're going to sit with you and we're going to provide value by helping you to explore what IT means to your business or what technology means to your business. It's all about you and at the end of that meeting you're going to have something really valuable uh, from it. Now, uh, I'm a big fan in uh, leaving the door as wide open as possible, the exit as wide open as possible for people. Um, so you, you can say up front to them, we're going to do this workshop. Even if you decide you don't think we're a good fit to work together, you're going to have some valuable information that's going to make your life easier to speak to another IT company going forward. And it's been my experience, Dennis, that the, the wider you leave that exit open, the, what, the more clearly you say to those business owners, hey, you may not work with us, you may decide we're not a good fit to work to, and that's okay, but the time is still going to be well spent. The why do you leave that exit open? My experience has been the more likely people are to work with you because they don't exactly. feel as though they're being sold to. They don't exactly. feel as though that's, they're that's under that's pressure. So a it's, it's a big thing. You know, Nobody that's wants to be sold to. Think about if... Um, most of us have had a door-to-door -door salesman and you immediately get or telephone calls when you're about to have dinner you immediately get irritated and, and you get more irritated don't you Dennis when they pick up the phone and they say hey this is not a sales call and you go well I know it is why are you uh, lying to me and you get off on it. <laughs> when yeah. any, any of us when somebody tries to sell something to us the wall goes up and we just want to push away but if people are being, being really upfront and saying, hey, look, you can end this conversation at any time, um, I'm, but if you, you know, there might be some value here, and it's okay if, if we, we don't end up working together. It really is. You don't have to feel awkward about it. The bigger the exit you give to people, the more likely they are to work with you, in my experience. Yeah, that's true. And, and how about scalability, Richard? Because uh, uh, I had a call with uh, James Wicker like uh, just on Tuesday or was like last week uh, about that okay so so that which we are talking about or you are talking about that's great because you are a CEO you can go and you can engage this client and you have you know everything behind you and uh, things like that but it's not a scalable model if you are the only guy 
So and and the and the problem for the people is that and and everything based on consultancy like law or just let's say like a dentist who, who has an expertise, it's really hard to scale those type of businesses. So how how do you see the scalability here? Yeah, I think um, building a framework or a system uh, for that type of thing um, makes it much more scalable because other people within the business. Uh, can do it. So most people who are on the line who are very familiar with the point where they've uh, created maybe a lot of value within their business but it's all stored up here. Yeah. They're the only person who can deal with a certain client or they're the only person who knows the answer to this uh, and so on. There's a real danger that once you start going down this road of uh, acting as a business consultant that again it's only you that can execute on on those ideas and it's only you that can have those meetings if you build a system if you build a framework about it you can help to bring other people onto those onto that role you can allow other people to go out and have those meetings as well so i think the system you know i'm a huge fan of the book the e myth revisited by yeah. michael gerber uh, had a transformative effect on my life it really was a life changing book when i read it um, and I go back and I refer to that all the time, but effectively what Mr. Gerber talks about is, you know, building processes and systems for your business to enable it to be scalable. So there's no getting away from the fact that whether it's technical, whether it's uh, HR related or whether it's even sales related um, and consultants related, having systems in place means that it's not dependent on you alone to do stuff. Exactly, and, and what I was thinking here is that basically the whole VCIO stuff is about systems and procedures and, and, and these type of things. And what I see from an Australian uh, client said that, you know what, Danish, I was able to sell those type of virtual CIO. I'm really good at that. I was able to do that. Uh, I quoted something because I didn't really know how much would it cost, but we are not making any money on that. Uh, that's what one. The second client said that, uh, you know what, the problem is that uh, we are not able to sell it because if I calculate how much money I should put there, they are not going to pay it. And that's because if you are not having well defined processes and you are not lean here, you are not able to make business. You don't make money or the client doesn't need because it's high price. So only one, like, let's see what you are doing with your MSP. You are using remote management, you are using PSA to drive out the fat of your processes. Of course, that's why, because the prices are going down and you have to compete and that's why, that's the same stuff which you have to do in the consultancy way as well to, to, to do this stuff. And I, I, if you said Michael Gerber, I said uh, you should think about the guy called Gary Harps. Gary Harps made e meet in practice. It's, uh, it's called six disciplines, and this is the methodology about uh, cycles and how you run your business. And we learned a lot from this system because we incorporated that methodology in Hungary with our coaching uh, program, coaching business. And we learned a lot how to create different type of you know uh, processes around consultancy, like how to do the yearly cycles, quarterly cycles. Uh, monthly, weekly cycles, how to manage those stuff and where you are able to get sideways. For example, I do projects for recurring service together separately. So it's like uh, you are going to have lots of questions, I guess, when you are into this stuff, but uh, it's really hard to, I don't know how, the starting phase, so what do you see, how, how to get the first client, the first contract, because that's the, or, always do you have the, have the first one. And you can learn it. You have something to, to learn. Who is the best candidate for that? Who is the best client for that? Where you know? So just let me know how you how you think that how how to get the first consultant kind of thing. I, I I think the there's a lot of parallels to for those of us who have gone through moving from the break fix model to managed services. Yeah. Yeah. When we went through that situation, or, or certainly for me, and I'm. I'm positive it's the same for lots of people on the call. When we decided we were going to become a managed service provider providing a flat fee IT support, there was probably two, three clients that we immediately thought they're going to get it. And indeed when we went to speak to them they said, yeah, we trust you, that sounds a great idea, we're going to do it. 
Then there's another set of clients that we think um, they might get it. They're going to take some time. Uh, and you go to them and you explain it, and some of them are going to surprise you and say, yeah, we get it, we want to come on board, but others are going to say, I'm not convinced, and that's okay, yeah. we work on them over time. Then there's that third bucket of uh, clients that we've, uh, we're all familiar with, and we, we spoke about them earlier on, Dennis, and that was the clients who don't pay on time, the clients who don't respect <laughs> what we say, and typically we, we make an assumption that we're going to go to them and say, hey, do you want to move to managed services, and they're going to go, no, we were not interested, but we still go and have that conversation. Um, and it might mean that at some point we say to them goodbye, we can't work with you anymore. Um, I think the same is for consultancy. If you want to get practice, if you want to understand how the process might work, think of your client base and highlight one, two, three clients that you think, I'm doing a bit of this already. They value our advice. They're asking us for, uh, for, for consultancy. Go with them and um, be open and honest with them. Say, hey, do you mind? I know we normally talk about technology. Do you mind if we have a conversation more about your business? And they'll be happy to. Uh, practice there. Understand what works, what doesn't work. Then you can use what you've learned to go to other clients. And the next time you speak to a new client, a prospective client, you can use some of those techniques as well. So I think for anybody on the call... Yeah. There's going to be clients who are a good fit to start talking with in a in the manner of a consultant almost immediately. Yeah. So so if you if you see that uh, it, I really like that kind of early adopter kind of approach that you say you know what we have a we have the idea I think the world is going there we have to learn it you know we can make mistakes but. Uh, you are the type of early adopter, so the CEOs like have complex operations, CEOs having like tech savvy uh, people thinking on technology, things like that. That can be great candidates, I think, for that type of stuff. And you you shouldn't be shy. And and one other thing, because I think most people can misunderstand the consultancy, is that uh, you know it's like hourly rate or whatever, and it's it's going to give you like a couple of hours of or more hours of work as a consultancy, but I don't see the monetizing just here. Why you see is good to have a consulting portion for your existing offering. What do you think the big hit here? And one thing, you guys, just let me know uh, the questions because then we go to the Q and A section after a couple of minutes. So just let let us know what we missed. Cool, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, questions as well from people. I, I, you put a really uh, interesting question about whether uh, businesses should add a consultancy um, part as well. Um, I think for the majority of slightly smaller MSPs, so um, the, uh, to immediately uh, create a consultancy division is probably a step too far immediately. I would start to put themselves out there as consultants, start to behave as a consultant would behave, a very professional, uh, start to ask questions about clients' business, and then see where it goes. And I think that once you start acquiring a reputation for, for that type of behavior, consultancy work will, uh, uh, opportunities will start to come your way anyway. Um, you attract like-minded people depending on the way that you behave. So I think you'll find that uh, consultancy opportunities come towards you. And then there's a decision to be made at some point, okay, do we have a separate consultancy division from the IT division? Um, that's a really interesting one, and I'm, I'm seeing lots of MSPs who are going down the road of doing a lot more business consultancy with very little to do uh, um, with pure technology. Technology has always got a part of business consultancy, I think. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of MSPs who are doing a lot more business consultancy. That's probably a question for another day to see where the industry uh, as a whole yeah. goes. I think most of us are, it would be a step too far to talk about business consultancy without a technology portion. Um, but smart businesses are starting to think about that already. Uh, that, that's great. What, what, what we we seen with the the, the clients and in our practice is basically if you if you are the you, you a front or or just tip of the arrow. So when you go into with this consulting, you are creating opportunities. So it's kind of uh, somebody told me it's like 
kind of perverse that I'm the client and I'm paying you to force this service and you are always tell me because what the what the virtual CIO is doing is the CIO and what the CIO is doing see the opportunities and see whether we need to invest or not so basically it's like it's like sales so what you are selling here first of all your existing services creating better security better infrastructure faster whatever kind of stuff you can resell like the traditional value added reseller model you can resell cloud based applications you can grab local people who serve this application like having a sales force and having a local sales force consultant you can manage those uh, you can manage this cool you know uh, 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 stuff around and you can create partnerships and get commission back and of course give back the half of the commission to the client to make it the fair uh, stuff uh, you could create a, like a, like a marketplace for yourself and for the different business problems create like packages you see I have a client here and, and we, we counted like 15 their system is working with 15 different cloud-based applications like learning management system, a base camp for project management, blah, 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 blah. And to, you know, they know each, all of this stuff, but creating the integration through Zapier, for example, it's, a, it's a good money, really. So you have to go through and they are value that because you are creating automation. So you are not making the money as an hourly rate, probably. You are making money on creating opportunities for lots of other perspective uh, uh, projects. So that's why you have to be open of what you are doing, because you are a generalist, basically, not just a specialist. Yeah, I mean, back when well, I was running an MSP, we used to call them um, strategic alliances. That was the, the, the name that we, we had. But I'll, I'll give you one uh, really clear-cut example. I remember going in to have a conversation with a, a larger client um, about taking on their IT infrastructure under managed services. Um, we had the conversation about the technology, and the um, the uh, business owner said to us, "Hey, I don't. You don't do. We need CRM, I think." So I talked a little bit about CRM, and he uh, and I said, "Yeah, it sounds as though you do." Um, he said, "Do you do CRM?" I said, "Well, no, we don't. But could I introduce you to our uh, uh, trusted friend?" Yeah who does do CRM, and you can have that conversation even if you choose not to work with us. I'm yeah. happy for you to have that conversation. Now, we ended up winning that business ahead of much bigger competitors because all of the competitors said, no, 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 we don't do CRM. Where what we did was say, really open and honest, and said, we don't do CRM, but we'll happily introduce you. And that right there was um, a degree of consultancy because we are, first of all, working out with them whether they do need a CRM. Yes, it sounds as though you do. Now, we're not going to do the work for you. Let us introduce you to someone we know does really good CRM work. Um, Great. And so the business came across through that way. That's awesome. We have a kind of provocative question here from Australia. I think these guys are just waking up and have a rough day. Right. Uh, I'm just joking. Uh, so we have a we have David here, and he's asking uh, from Richard that do you know any MSPs who run a scalable and profitable MSP2 services or business IT consultancy focused business? I think that's a really great question. Are there any examples which we can follow? I, well, I think we've already mentioned one uh, during the webinar, haven't we? So um, uh, uh, ProDrive IT. ProDrive. Are a business that is moving in that direction, um, and I, I, you know, I'm, uh, I've known Bruce for a number of years. I've worked with him as a, he's been a client of mine for a number of years. So, for anybody watching this who wants an example of what this might look like, I think Dennis, you did a, a wonderful uh, webinar, uh, probably about two months ago, was it? And is the recording yeah, yeah, yeah. still available? Yeah, it's it's in the free section, so in the free resources, you can yeah. you can get it. Yeah, no, I mean, I uh, I sat and watched that here in the UK, and I watched Bruce and uh, Denise talk through that. I think that's a really valuable insight into what that can look like. So in answer to the question, yeah, there are the businesses out there doing this already. Um, not a huge amount, I'm going to say, because no. this is fairly cutting edge, and this is fairly uh, forward thinking, but there are businesses doing it. Yeah, and what I see here, and, and my, my answer for this question is that uh, it's it, if you don't have, if you don't have a tool, what I see here is that you you really hard to, to do it because 
if you think about what you need to do to create a scalable business here, okay, right, what we covered, you need to create the service offerings, you need to create all the processes, and you need to create the education, you need to create tools, and you need to create like some kind of plan around that, and you have to invest a lot of time what you don't have to, to create those type of services in a written format, validated, uh, a tried out, battle tested, to be able to move forward, and that takes time. And what I see now, we we have the scalability factors in here or there with other companies because someone do a playbook for virtual CIO, someone do really great quarterly plans, someone is having you know really great yearly planning kind of best practice. So when we collect all these best practices for all the MSPs and we can incorporate to kind of one system or something like that, then we are able to talk about the basis of scalability. Uh, and because it's a huge investment, uh, I think it's like we have to wait for a couple of years to come from MSP. And for example, there are companies like, for example, there are other companies, but for we, for example, we invest a huge amount of time to create the triggers of the scalability. So what, what scalability? Selling it. You know, you have the questionnaires, standing on something. So we, we are working on really heavily on that. But I, to be honest, I, I, haven't I haven't seen so many really great scalable business on consultancy. I have seen who have the main business on general consultancy and they get IT. So who has the, you know, the, the background on consultancy, you know that, and, and on coaching. But who have coming from the IT type of business, it's, it's like years to learn that. So uh, I have to say that if you want scalability, open yellow pages and get your local general consultancy business and go there and talk with them. How you do that? How you create you know, these type of services to your clients because that business to business stuff, not IT uh, kind of stuff. I, I think there you can learn a lot. And uh, I'm sorry, we are ra running out of time all the time, that's the problem. It, it just uh, having back to the work to you, Richard, just give us uh, like three advice, thoughts, takeaways, something to the people, how you can summarize this uh, talk or what you are thinking and uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think the first one, practical advice, the, um, if, if the last time that you, any of you spoke to your client was to do with a technical issue, then change that. Make sure that you pick up the phone or you go and visit your clients um, not to fix something, but to talk to them about their business. To say, hey, can I come by? Can I have a cup of tea? Can I have a cup of coffee with you? Uh, and can I just hear how your business is going? So that's the first tip I would say. And you'll learn an awful lot just from doing that. Yeah, that, that's the a second, really great one. The, the, the second tip is um, I would say um, when you sit down and have a conversation with the clients, um, try to only be talking maybe 20% of the time. Now, as I said earlier on, for somebody like me who loves to talk, that's a really yeah, difficult like one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but go in there and ask pertinent questions, but let them do the talking. So when you come away from that conversation, hopefully you're, you've only been speaking 20% of the time, and they're the ones who have been uh, 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 doing all of the talking. Again, I think you'll learn so much from keeping your ears open and your mouth closed a little bit more. And I think the, um, the third one is um, not to make assumptions over um, what they're going to say or uh, what their, their issues are. So if they tell you that they've got, we earlier on in the webinar we said, you know, if a client might say to you, oh, my staff productivity is down. As technicians, we automatically make assumptions about how we can fix that. I wouldn't make the assumption, and again, I would ask the question, how does that affect you? Um, what impact does that have on the profitability of the business? What impact does it have on you? And then, at the end, don't try and be the hero and jump in with a solution, but say to them, how do you see me helping you? Yeah, and they'll that's, tell that's, you what they want. <laughs> that's just awesome. I, I really like that conversation, Richard. I'm really, really thankful that ha having you today. And uh, I think this is just tipping of the iceberg. So we, are, we, we have a lot of things to talk and work. And the whole industry have to give to the MSPs to make it able to do this scalable business. 
just referring to your 20% talk and 80% listening, I don't know we should send a, a feature request for uh, Apple that to the next iPhone should be some sensor for that, so you can, <laughs> you can gauge uh, that stuff, and I think that we are going to create a better world with that feature. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey, just one tip for um, the next time you go in uh, to a client meeting, why not? Why not ask them if it's okay if you record it, uh, and then afterwards, afterwards, um, you know, play it back and see how much you talk and yeah. how much they talk. Could be really That's interesting. Fair. Yeah, that could be a mirror which you don't want to see into. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. That was awesome. And uh, for everybody, that's uh, uh, based on Peter. Peter is doing the, the recording uh, and uh, he's going to publish it, I think, today. So uh, if you want to share it with other colleagues and uh, other people, just uh, please do. And thank you for having us and thank you for the questions. And uh, we are going to have the next one in uh, 1st of October with Eric Dozo. Is going to go into the virtual CIO reporting. How virtual CIO can use reporting to to engage more the clients during the quarterly meetings, monthly meetings. What the different metrics can use as a VCI. What can be automated coming from your existing system things like that. I, Eric is a great guy. He's a white viewer like me, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to to this talk as well. So we have all the great guys to you here. Uh, we are shipping that in that format. So thank you very much for everybody from you, Richard, and uh, I go to shower my road, and you go to make some some time. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.